this very morning when I was re-preparing this presentation because I tend to change slides and orders five minutes prior to beginning my lectures on a daily basis, my students know that. Then when I saved through the flash drive, I noticed that it was exactly one year ago, the last time we met each other. It was March the 1st, 2017. So thank you very much for having me back. Thank you. Now, today it's going to be an, a journey or enterprise because, of course, it's very difficult to deal with those two very important categories such as modern or modernism and postmodern or postmodernism. And as a matter of fact, what I plan on doing is to explore certain narratives about modernity, modernism, and postmodern as a response to those narratives. And therefore, I think that I'll be dividing our meeting in two sections, hopefully very symmetric. The first one, we are going to try to explore four important notions directly related to the very concept of modern. And needless to say, being an art historian, I'll be focusing exclusively, if not primarily, but exclusively indeed, on visual artifacts. And in the second part, devoted to postmodern art and theories, I am going to go and explore a more conceptual road, and therefore we're going to be talking about major philosophers, thinkers who have dealt with this very concept of how can we reply, how can we rebuild what has been collapsed, there is to say, the modern era. Like always in my life, everything starts in Rome, and I would love to get started indeed with this image. It's an image created around 1585 by a Flemish master who traveled to Rome. And while he was in Rome, of course, he has the opportunity to visit the Colosseum. But what is so interesting in this particular image is the angle and the aspect of the Colosseum. In fact, more than looking at the monument itself, we're looking at what remains of the monument. And the perspective, as you can see here, it's a very articulated one as to almost immediately include the viewer into the very entrance of the Colosseum. So while you are going to have your gaze invited to explore the space, in the other side you have the uh, monumental marble made facade, the original facade of the Colosseum. So it is paradoxical because indeed what we have here is the perception of the decay of something didn't used to be considered, regarded, respected as a monument, to the point that for centuries people would have gone to the Colosseum to literally use it as just a source for materials. So they could take fragments of marble, statues, bricks to make their own houses in what we would call nowadays the Middle Ages. But at a certain point, people refrained from doing that. They stopped. In fact, nowadays, it would be inconceivable for any one of us just to go there and to steal a little piece of marble because it's no longer just a document, but it's a monument. And therefore, it ought to be preserved. And as I'm going to argue today, this very notion of preservation and a symbol that belongs to our collective memory is at the very core of the rising of the notion of modernity what we are still thinking of as modern. The very word comes from Latin, modernus. And modernus, in the first century at least, it was used as a verb, as a tense, just to mark that you are talking about something current, something present, something that is happening now. We would use the contemporary, but for Romans, what was modernus, it was opposed to the old, ancient. So there is a notion of temporality, time, preservation. There are major points, in fact, that we are going to explore. But I would like to introduce the Colosseum or the decay of the Colosseum and this very concept that now we know that what we are looking at is not so much the object, the architecture, but what remains and therefore the destroyed Colosseum by the action of the barbarians. So, of course, there's also this notion of differentiation. We know that collectively we are sharing ideas and therefore attitudes, and they are time-related, 
to preserve what we believe as being important because that's part of how or who we are. And in fact, the four points that I would like to explore, first of all, this idea of historical distance. People are going in the 15th century to become aware that they were modern in a sense, in a semantic implication that we are still using nowadays because there was a historical distance. In fact, through Petrarch and throughout the 15th century, there is this definition of a new temporality. We know that we are now, and therefore we no longer belong to what they would call the middle or dark ages, but we wanted to retrieve that remote past, not the old, the ancient, so antiquity. So this notion of historical distance is essential because thanks to this self-awareness, this increasing self-consciousness, people are going also to have a different attitude. Those bricks, those marbles, they are not just materials. They've been modified. In fact, they have not only traces of the time, but also they are somehow related to the artists, the architects, the people who had transformed them. So the materials, they became artifacts. And therefore, a new kind of appreciation that we would call aesthetic has begun being practiced and exercised more consistently from what we would call nowadays the Renaissance on. Then, because of that, we are going to have a different narrative. Because people are going to use the materials differently, and therefore they are going to use also different devices and faculties, it's not only a mere problem of manuality, being very virtuous in the use of the hands, but to have certain agendas, certain intellectually driven expectations and capacities. And therefore, what we are going to value in the raising of modernism is the idea of innovation. For you to be part of the community of artists, you are expected to innovate. You are expected to know the tradition very well, to know the value of the past in order to truly transform it into something new. So this perception of the new, the newness, the novelty, they are going to play major roles in the definition of modern. And along with that, the idea that what is new is also an elaboration of a personal possibility. So we are going to have something very important for ourselves nowadays, the idea that art is a creation and that this creation is profoundly tied, sometimes mysteriously tied, to a notion of subjectivity. There are subjects with their own inner lives, with their own sometimes very difficult to describe, to understand intentionalities that are the creators of the new that we have to appreciate in order to understand whom we are in present, modernus days. So the Colosseum, I thought it was a very good idea because when people start explaining the Renaissance, for instance, this very misleading definition, rebirth, well, how came that there was such a rebirth based on certain narratives of discovery if actually very few of the statues, very few of the fragments, they were indeed unearthed. They have been for centuries before the eyes of everybody else. But people would just have a different value. They would neglect. Sometimes they would feel that they were just annoying pieces disturbing the road. And we have plenty of documentation about that, that especially from the fifth up to the 13th century in Rome, most of the statues, the sarcophagi, with very relevant uh, exceptions, of course, but mostly they were there, the temples. They have never been hidden, only few. But how come that they have never been felt as part of the community's own consciousness? And they were there. They were never to be discovered. No, they were newly valued. They were differently appreciated. And that's the very point. At a certain moment, People started getting a new interest. Oh, those are not only fragments of pagans, those people who had destroyed. No, those are also witnesses of a great period in which we can trace back Plato, Aristotle, Marcus Aurelius, great thinkers, thinkers that indeed, from a Christian perspective, even though they were born before Christ, they were so clever, so intelligent, that they might have evocatively spoken about Christian values, 
through metaphors, through allegories. So now what we ought to do is to reassess and to reinterpret the past. And they're going to take it quite seriously. They're going to measure, to try to understand not only the forms, but the farming process. So not just the appearances, and that's a very important part to take measurements and make calculations, but also the working procedures, the creative patterns. So what lied behind the creation of those works? And because of that, structures such as Colosseum, that for centuries have been described as a decayed place in which pagans had killed many Christians, and there was this narrative, and therefore it was a place quite disturbing from a Christian perspective. But then they noticed that along with that narrative, the Colosseum could be also a source of inspiration. And I know this is a very romantic vocabulary, but they would talk about this furor platonicus, or this moment of insight when you are facing something and you have that epiphanic moment of revelation. Oh my God, this is an important monument because here I can understand certain values, certain attitudes that we're still having, but then I can move backwards to the understanding of its foundations. And that's the reason why the Colosseum, so very consistently represented in this decayed kind of uh, image, it's going to become newly represented in a much more, I would say, calculated, mathematically driven form as a manifesto of what was the greatness of Rome and therefore to set a model for us to retrieve and to understand. With this raising of consciousness, people started having a distance but also a closer, paradoxically, relationship with the past. I know now that I have to be very selective and I have to understand exactly why I'm using and trying to reuse those same models. And that, in fact, is uh, particularly noticeable in the very guides of Rome. It's a fascinating source of research, neglected, unfortunately, by many of my colleagues, but if you read the guides, the touristic guides, indeed, of Rome, you are going to notice a very spectacular difference from the years, the centuries that we would call the medieval ones, and the new spirit of the Renaissance, basically from the 15th. If you'd like to have a date, I would even set 1401, because that's the year in which Brunelleschi, Donatello, they went to Rome. Well, prior to that, you would have many guides before the printing machine was invented, they circulated as pocketable little guides made in parchment, and therefore they were sources for pilgrims to use. They were handwritten manuscripts with very few illustrations, and they were usually called Mirabilia Urbis Rome, the wonders of the city of Rome. But Mirabilia, literally as the miracle, so it had a very specific devotional, religious connotation. Pilgrims were the audiences for those guides. So they would read because the facts that they would find described and later on illustrated for centuries, they were exclusively related to devotional purposes. So you would find the map of the relics, the names of all saints, where they were buried, where you could find the best mass celebration dedicated to St. John the Baptist or to St. John the Evangelist and so forth. So they were very practical tools. But interestingly, those manuscripts were widely, widely circulated. Well, ever since the printing machine was invented and the Mirabilia became books, the first pocketbook guided tours that we had notice of in Rome at least, illustrations started changing too. So they would pay attention, not so much to the destination, to the sites themselves from a religious, exclusively religious standpoint, but they would start describing characteristics, sometimes external features of artworks. So the measurements of an obelisk. And later on, along with this beginning of a new aesthetic appreciation, because here, there is no remark whatsoever regarding its devotional purposes. In fact, it is one of the earliest representations of art per se, I would say. And to the point that what's going to prevail by the end of the 15th century are the illustrations over the text. And the illustrations, they are going to uh, translate into images, not so much the places that you as a pilgrim, as a worshiper, as a believer, you were expected to do, 
But more culturally speaking, they would describe the images. And within the images, the moment in which you could savor particular creations. Michelangelo is going to become, of course, one of the most recurrent features. So those guides that were for pilgrimage at first, during the Middle Ages, with the raising of this new consciousness, aesthetically oriented, they are going to focus on the artworks. So no longer the place where St. Sebastian had suffered his martyrdom, but the place where you can find the Christ made by Michelangelo. Cultural pilgrims, indeed. That's the kind of tourism that most of us are still sharing. So we would go also for religious purposes, but along with that, so not in denial or necessarily in opposition to, but smoothly in a fusion with, we're going to have this new kind of evaluation, aesthetic, based on the artistic capacity of one particular individual. And later on, we are going to have the total shift. And the later guides, they are going to focus exclusively on the art-oriented points. So no longer the sides or the uh, religious narratives, but the art narratives. And what is so interesting, that in the case of this detail by Michelangelo, some of the authors, they're going to be very descriptive. And what they will be try to translate verbally or through images are the peculiar features that made this statue something that is absolutely inimitable, something that marks the very presence of Michelangelo. The texture, the rendering, the style. Which means that very often the iconography, whether it's a Christ or a Bacchus, it doesn't matter. Because all that people are going to be central and absolutely interested in is the fact that it's by Michelangelo. Think about our own experiences. We would use as a sort of a metonymy this expression such, oh, I've been to see Picasso in Portland. Oh, good for you. I wish I could have ever a coffee with Picasso, right? But we are just assuming that the personality and the work, they are just amalgamated together. That's the beginning of this process. Prior to the 15th century, a work of art had a very specific function, mostly religious. But then with the ascending idea of aesthetic appreciation, subjectivity, and what we would call art, or images, they had a much more subtle, nuanced use or no use at all. In fact, that changes a lot if you compare reactions, responses, uses of images prior to the 15th century. Some of the most diffused artworks in medieval times were the so-called akeropoieta. Or if you are not familiar with the ancient Greek, well, there you go, akeropoieta, images that were believed to be made, poieta, without hands. So they were miraculous images in that there is no master behind. And that's the reason why they are not natural. They don't look like my uncle or my dog, or, because they are not. They're the very transcendental being, which is not represented. It is present. So there was this idea that icons could have healing powers to the point that very often we're going to have iconoclastic reactions against, because icons could be used as idols. And the borderline is very subtle, indeed. Because they were believed to have those properties, people would get closer to them, would touch, would kiss, would lick. And in fact, many of those acheropoietic images, well, they were the very core or the beginning of the construction of many churches. The Church of Santa Maria Maggiore, the first church ever dedicated to the cult of uh, the Holy Virgin, the Madonna, well, it was created in order to protect one of those acheropoietic images. And in fact, that image is still there. And even nowadays, if you go to Rome, for instance, in December the 8th, that's one of the few days in which they open the image for public veneration, which means that they are retrieving its very original historical function. But because, of course, of our new sense of monument and preservation, we have a glass. So people are going to kiss over the glass and no longer removing. That's the reason why the poor face of the baby is almost erased. Because after centuries of this kind of religious pilgrimage that people would be touching, and the closer the better, because you are going to absorb 
the thaumaturgical, the miraculous, the healing powers of the images. Well, this is going to change quite drastically, in fact, throughout the Renaissance, because images, they're going to be, first of all, conceived as a representation made by someone whose style is ultimately going to be the very distinctive factor of an image. So when Leonardo da Vinci created uh, the very well-known Benoit Madonna, because it used to belong to this Benoit guy who moved to St. Petersburg, where you can find this wonderful little piece nowadays. What he did, he transformed the previous iconography and he reoriented the image, thus transfusing also a new sentiment, which we would call artistic. And you wouldn't feel like kissing, well, I would, but Leonardo da Vinci, because of course we have this historical distance and we are aware that this is a particular formulation by a particular man in order to have particular effects. So it's no longer poetic. In fact, it is artificial. It is handmade and so important handmade that here we're going to acknowledge certain choices, certain orientations, certain preferences. We could even call them the system of taste, Leonardo's or Leonardo's patron's taste. Indeed, look at the way, for instance, the Madonna and the baby, they're having this conversation from a psychological dimension. This is just stunning. There is such a depth in the feelings, in the emotions. So even if you forget for a moment that you were dealing with religious people and you have just a halo to remind you, because otherwise the interior looks just like a 15th century building that you could find in Milan, in Rome, but you do have this religious clue, almost as a sort of a visual reminder. This is also a religious image. But even nowadays, of course, to prevail would be the appreciation of the sfumato, the rendering of this iconography in such a gracious way. The Madonna, she's not sad. The baby is very serious because he knows that what he is doing, it's not just touching a flower, but there is a symbolic element to it. So he's embracing his very sacrifice, hence the seriousness. This baby is both a baby and the anticipation of his very fate, and he knows that. He looks just too serious to enjoy, while the Madonna, almost as though she was trying to, that's your mission after all, let's, you know, be crucified playfully. It looks like a Monty Python, let's have fun after all, that's your life, your mission, etc. So there is a narrative that you can understand but feel. And even more importantly than those two elements, and along with them, you are going to acknowledge that this is a creation. The elements, they were not fortuitously arranged. They have been combined. So the master had gone through preliminary drawings. In fact, we have at least three surviving drawings for this composition, the legs. Leonardo didn't know where to pose, how to, to, to make the pose of the Virgin. He had many ideas. That's the point. With the Akeropoietic uh, image, you wouldn't think about that. It's an icon. It has a fixed role in the least naturalistically looking, so much the better. So you're going to think about the metaphysical life behind it. In the case of Leonardo, the engagement is going to be more emotional, intellectual, but also artistic. Artistic to the point that one of the most powerful ladies of Italian Renaissance, Isabella d'Este, well, because she was rebuilt in her own castle in Mantua, and she wanted to have works of art, so there was a different approach, she knew that she wanted some pieces, not because they were religious, not because they were pagan, not because they were mythological, but because they were the pictorial emblems of those masters. And she wanted to have a piece by Leonardo da Vinci. There are four letters uh, that survived with the exchange. She had never met Leonardo in person, but she had many art dealers or promoters, and they were searchers, and one of them went three times, moving around because Leonardo was moving from Florence to Venice, and then from Venice to Florence again, and then to Rome, and the guy went back and just knocked at Leonardo's door. And what is so impressive is that in all those letters, the leitmotif is the same. I want to have a work, un'opera, a work, 
by Leonardo, but Isabella uses a most eloquent expression, per mano de, by the hands of Leonardo. So there is also the distinction that the hands, the actual work of a, an artist, is different from his collaborators or followers. So she wanted to have an original by Leonardo. And originality is, again, another very important motion, notion for the raising of the concept of modern. It is modern because I have improved upon the tradition and I made it. It's not a replica, it's not a copy, it's not a forgery, but it has its own authenticity. It can be reproduced later on through prints, engravings, but the uniqueness remains the same. And this idea of uniqueness is going to raise for the very first time in early modern era here in this exchange. She wanted at first, she very humbly addressed Leonardo, well, preferably, because you know other artists, they're going to give me some images of the Madonna with the child, preferably, but the adverb is very, very shy. I would love if possibly it would be an image of a Madonna. But if he, he didn't want to, he, he, well, it could be whatever. It's, you know, provided it's per mano de Leonardo. So that changes a lot indeed, because that's the beginning of our appreciation of the, what I could call the indexicality of the artist. In semiotics, indexicality refers to the traces left by an artist while making their works. And here, you can acknowledge a face, you can even see what is unseen, there is to say the hair, the moving hair, but what you cannot miss is the very presence of Leonardo's hand. And I mean it, here you can see the very moment, the, the furious way in which he's using the brush strokes, and therefore he's using the pigments, and the traces of Leonardo's presence, and therefore his indexical presence, is as important as the physiognomy itself. So when this art piece, which is indeed incomplete, it's not finished, so what? Would you refrain from having a Leonardo because it's not completely filled with pigments? And that's exactly the kind of appreciation that nowadays we just assume, but that was the beginning of that. Prior to this very historical transition, many people would just deny value to this work. It's not finished, why should I care? I need to have an image to be displayed in my chapter. No, not now. In fact, that's the beginning, along with the appreciation of modern art, art collecting, which entails a new kind of appreciation and values that are not really there. When we are perplexed nowadays about quotations, when Leonardo that has been sold for 400,000 millions, blah, blah, too many zeros for me to understand. Well, that's the point. Materially, it's a paper or a canvas or a wood panel with pigments, but we know better than that because what really provides the value of those art works it's no longer the material. And that's one of the major distinctions between the contracts during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. In Middle medieval contracts, you would have a prescription, very severe, very strict, about the elements, the pigments, the kind of materials that were supposed to be used, lapis lazuli, gold, silver, and crystal, or precious gems, because they were precious. It goes without saying they would made the material, and therefore the image, even more precious exactly the opposite of any Renaissance-oriented artist. Because he or she would rather prefer to use mud, to use the least important of the materials. Leonardo didn't use colors almost. In fact, he used the poorest colors, the most, the cheapest ingredients. But the point is, he was able almost alchemically to transform the raw materials into the preciousness, in fact, the priceless creation of his individual style. So this raises the very question of what is the value attached to those images. When a Pablo Picasso, with this fragmented portrait of one of his first art dealers, Ambroise Vollard, well, what we see and understand, it's not so much the mirroring form or the portrait, it's there, but it's not the essence of the painting. The creative process, the enterprise, the creative agenda, what is the problem that he's trying to solve? So art, with this new idea of modernity, has become some kind of problem-solving question. 
that you are going to raise and the kind of question that you are going to ask is going to orient the very value of the work. Some of the uh, works, for instance, nowadays, if I were to create a cubist form of art, might be nice. You know, the Sunday painters, that's fine. I play the piano for myself too, but, but I'm no Chopin. And that's the point. So the historical consciousness that what you were doing, it's not just individual. Your sense of individual value is going to be directly related to your social belonging and your historical connection. So when Picasso broke literally the mirror and created one of the earliest cubist portraits, he was doing something new. Therefore, he was innovating upon the tradition. And that's our third point in the scale of modernity. So he was challenging. And this idea of chronology, ascending process, etc., has been very often connected to the narratives of what is modern. One of the earliest biographical accounts of the Renaissance art, Giorgio Vasari's book, he claims that Giotto was very important. But he made, Giorgio Vasari's words, not mine, awkward figures. Because they, even though they were important in that they were no longer Byzantine, they didn't look like schemes, well, they were far from being as naturalistic as the artists of the second generation, such as Masaccio. And even farther from the artists of what he calls the bella maniera, the beautiful manner, inaugurated by no one else than Leonardo da Vinci. Because here, he has attained a degree of exquisite naturalness that it's no longer related to schemes of representation. It looks just like nature itself. And nature can be very ambiguous. Depending on the days, if there is a certain haziness in the air, today is raining, you can't see the front river as clearly as in other days. So that's exactly what Leonardo is improving on, not just imitating forms, but providing our very possibility of experiencing forms in their very process of gradual formation. Now, what a challenge to provide visual shapes of this phenomena while they are happening. So you're not just getting stuck with a fixed form with sharp outlined lines. No, but the very metamorphic idea of everlasting and absolutely ever transforming processes, not results, but processes, indeed. But then, Michelangelo, according to Giorgio Vasari, will be definitely the top, the peak, because along with his wonderful depiction of natural phenomena, he has also betrayed nature. That is to say, he has created something that nature itself wasn't able to, the license, the poetic freedom. So he is going to create farms that at the same time they look as though they were antique, but they are not. So he's playing with the models. They look as though they were real, natural, but they are not. So a double betrayal. And more importantly, you're going to see, as in this beautiful detail of this wonderful tondo with the Madonna, the baby Jesus, and a young St. John the Baptist, you're going to see for the entire artwork, the artist's presence. Here you can identify the signs that's that stands for a woman sitting on a block. Then you have another body that's the young baby. And then you have this face. But what about those elements? Why are they there? Well, that's precisely what, they make, that, what makes the work so unique. The presence of the artist, which is not just mimicking nature, but it's expressing or giving forms that belong to art itself. So that's the ultimate conquest. No longer nature, no longer antiquity, then both. And the third element, creativity. So that stands as modernus for Vasari indeed. And it's so modernus in that it's not something calculated that the artist knows because he is a knowledgeable man, he is well versed in forms, and he knows therefore critically what we know. It's something, and that makes the whole difference, that it's also instinctive. And therefore, it's something that comes out of a sphere of mind, intellect, heart, that not even Vasari or our psychiatrists nowadays would discover or define. And because of the mystery of its source, it makes it even more compelling. So you're going to find the same kind of traces in the carving of a marble or in the making of a drawing. 
Now, can you see forms here? Barely. Maybe you can see the emerging of a leg and the drapery. But I dare say that if we had recognized here the style of Michelangelo, the style of Henri Matisse, a fragment of Vasil Kandinsky, we would have loved to possess that for different kind of values, indeed. The same values that it's going to become more and more programmatically exposed. In 15th and mostly 16th century art, we're going to have very often creations such as this, a visual oxymoron. It's a contradiction. On the upper part of this wonderful Dutch master called Hendrik Holtzius, at the Halliford Museum, and I'd like to think that I help in that, well, at the Halliford Museum, we have three original, recently purchased works by Hendrik Horst. Uh, his name no longer rings any bell, I understand that, but he used to be so highly regarded that when Hembrandt, who was one of the richest art collectors of 17th century Netherlands, well, when he was broken and he had to sell even his Albrecht de Duhers, and look, he didn't want to sell his prints or drawings made by Hendrik Horst. And they were mostly made with this double kind of texture. On the one side, he uses crayons and some other charcoal-based elements to create a more realistic portrait of this artist. Unbelievable. You can feel the texture of the different, the skin, the beard. And what about this? This is not incomplete. But here, of course, he exposed other forms himself. And this idea that the artist is going to both show his ability to represent very mimetically, very convincingly nature, but also expose that kind of hidden gear, those structures of his own dictator, of his own style, is going to be more and more programmatic. And what would be the shock to change from here to impression soleil levant, impression sunrise. Now, would you care whether sunrise or sunshine? Of course not. But what you would appreciate first and foremost, the very presence of a creative agenda at work. So the tracks, they're both in indexical presence of Claude Monet, while also referring to a theme that could be poetic, such as the, the sunrise, etc. But here, the aesthetics of the form and therefore, the idea that this is an individual, very innovative creation, first of all, you don't have any textual basis. You don't have a narrative to be illustrated. And that has been a major anchor for most, for more than four to five centuries, that art, visual arts, with the exception of those artists who had created their own visual poetry, was somehow subordinated to texts. So they would illustrate biblical subjects or mythological stories. So the stories that you have already read or heard about. Now, no, what's the source here? But the very impression, subjective idea, he is looking at, and while looking at, translating it. And Monet is going to have a very programmatic choice indeed. He's going to rent for a few months or possibly for two years, depending on the, uh, the date, between 1892 and 1893, a little apartment here in this part of the um, main square of the cathedral of Rouen in Normandy, in northern France. And he's going on a daily basis to capture his own impressions, hence the movement of the impressionism or impressionism. I am trying to translate the very metamorphosis of the forms as and during my observation process. So I'm trying to cap capture my own subjectivity, the ways nature is changing, and I'm perceiving it. So in the morning, of course, the colors, they're going to alter the object. So the object, per se, no longer exists. It exists only in relation to being perceived by a subject. So the object has become a sort of a colonize the slave of the subject, of the artist. And he's going to explore the nuances and the variations of the colors, of the forms. So they look as though they were represented before our eyes, but more importantly, through the lens of Claude Monet. And that's another major point for modern art. 
we are no longer using or being limited to our perspectives, to our own isolated individuality, but we are also having the possibility of becoming someone and looking through someone else's eyes. In that idea that through the other, I can become myself, well, that's one of the major goals of modern art. So we can experience, for instance, thanks to the expressionists or the German artists, very important for the raising of modernity indeed, this idea that art can very well capture my impressions, my subjective perception of reality. But what about my turmoils, my dramas, my fears? They are going to change my perception of the object. Well, just think about ourselves. If you're in a good mood, or if you're just irritated, the world is going to look differently. Of course, our perception is going to be motivated very often in our reception to by our ideas, our psychology, and therefore what German artists were trying to do at the beginning of the 20th century to express and therefore altering the perception of the objects. Again, art has become subjectivity to the point that it's no longer anchored to nature at all. And when Vasily Kandinsky has painted a local church in the uh, city of Murnau, he was still referring to nature, to an urban scape. But then he's going to move so forward as to create in 1910 what he proudly called the first abstract watercolor. Abstract. Abstraction. I no longer need nature to express my feelings. In fact, reds, blues, certain rhythms, certain frantic lines, certain broken elements, they are going to express deeper, differently, certain feelings, certain resonances. And he knew that there was so new that more than updating the tradition, there was so ultra-modern that nature had ceased to have any part. It was a moment that we would call revolutionary indeed. And that's the reason why artists from the Renaissance on, they are going to write about their art. Because art is no longer a form-making process but it entails reasoning, thinking, reflecting upon. They are signifiers of ideas, of emotions, and very often the subjectivity is also related to social matters. So in this case, Kandinsk had the urge of publishing a text called Über das Geist in der Kunst, or On the Spiritual in the Art. Think about that. We started with the acheropoietic images, whose primary function was to express the divine, to render what cannot be rendered, the metaphysical being. So now there is another approach to spirituality, which is filtered through in coming by the very inner life of an artist. So each one of us, we would have a different spiritual, intellectual experience. And for those who know German, Geist, is one of the most complex words to be translated because it could be translated as intellectually driven faculties or spiritual in a religious, mystic sense or mental, etc. So here we have this multi-layered complex idea of art, philosophy, innovation that needs to be learned and therefore explained. With that, I think we can stop and then we shall continue in the second part I would like for you to keep your questions, uh, so if I will not go into answer in my second part, then we can have our 15 minutes of conversation, okay? Thank you. So the narrative that we've been undertaking thus far, built up upon the notion that there is a development, uh, which is not necessarily a progress or an evolution, it could be uh, in multiple directions, but there is this idea that individuals are going to contribute through their highly subjective, in fact, unique kind of approach. So everyone's style, everyone's ideas, they are going to build the progression of the arts. In arts, even though they are the result of this highly individual approach, they ought to have some kind of social function. And many of the modern artists, especially in the so-called avant-garde, they would believe that they could change their society. 
In the case of Vasily Kandinsky, there is this notion of introspective uh, re self reflection. We are going to think, to excavate deeper and deeper in ourselves. But other artists, especially the group led by Piet Mondrian, the, the style, well, they are going to call themselves the neoplastics in that they were creating forms that were new, and they were the result of an almost platonic idea of examining natural forms, avoiding everything that is accidental, that can be changed, that can transform itself up to a degree of purification of the forms, of reordering, that it's going to achieve this ultimate expression of order, cleanness, and perfect society. So it's not only the creation of paintings, but they do reflect an ideological agenda in that that could be used for many reasons. Because we're going to neutralize what could be the difference of social status, everyone, regardless of his or her professions, his or her incomes, they're going to have similarly abstract, geometric, purified houses. So we are going to try, in a very uh, early communist-oriented ideology, to have this idea that we are living in an almost equalitarian society. Even the furniture, everything. And strangely as it may sound, I sat, and it's pretty comfortable. <laughs> Incredible, it is. It's like a massage of geometry, but it works. So the colors, they are not the nuanced tonalities, but sharp, the primary colors. Everything is geometric, because everything goes beyond what we've been talking about thus far, the subjectivity, because it is the result of a process that can be shared, and therefore can transform the society. The neoplasticism is a highly utopia-oriented movement. They really wanted to recreate the society, and therefore the farms in which this society could be organized, even on a daily basis. So the houses, the roads, the furniture, uh, everything. But then, of course, this is the utopian side of the modernity, of the avant-garde. There were other critics, people who disbelieve in all that. And they would even deny the very value of this as creative forms or social forms of appreciation. And they would, in fact, point out, such as Marcel Duchamp, that this is all bull, blah, 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 because it is. And he would say, there is no such a thing as universal value. They are trying to transform their society. But this is a very misleading ideological platform, because they are indeed creating a narrative that only Europeans who can afford those architects would be and in possessing those houses. So there is always a social differentiator. There is also divide, and therefore art shouldn't be at the service of those ideologies, communist or, but it should point out the narratives behind those forms that are considered universally beautiful, consensually shared, and that is in fact the striking conceptual enterprise undertaken by Marcel Duchamp. When he first exhibited his fountain, <laughs> which is nothing else than a male urinor reversed, in a gallery, can you imagine the reception of this work? Of course, they all was well perplexed, to say the least. <laughs> it was refused. First of all, it was uh, we've been talking about creation, subjectivity, historical distance. Well, this is a useful, broken, dirty, ridiculous urinal. So why should I create or why should I appreciate it? Because it was displayed in a gallery or in a museum. So does the space create the value? Hmm, it might. In fact, even nowadays, we may go to a museum with already the expectation that whatever is going to be there, regardless of our preferences, our taste, it's going to have some value. Because of course now we reach a degree of, I would say, condensation and accumulation of monuments, re um, preservation, uh, sense of historical belonging, etc. that now we are just assuming that certain places have already 
the very function of working as containers of values. So whatever is going to be displayed at the Metropolitan Museum, because it is at the Metropolitan Museum, hence, well, this equation is exactly what Marcel Duchamp is going to point out. And he's going to point out using those same elements that were universally accepted, the myths of the modernity, Leonardo's Mona Lisa. Who would dare denying value, beauty to this work? Oh, he would, and provocatively, L-H-O-O-Q. If you know any French, please don't let me translate, because I would be embarrassed. So can you imagine the first time that he showed in a gallery in Paris, uh, Monsieur Lafort, uh, and there is the, the description of this moment in which he asked, people were so irritated, oh, what is this arrogant, you know, what does he want? And what is this work? It's a very badly reproduced and artificially overpainted reproduction with the mustache of Mona Lisa. What is it about? And he would just ask for them to read. If you read in French, as an abbreviation, you are not going to read the words, but phonetically, it evokes la chocu, which means, and I apologize, that's Marcel Duchamp's words, her ass is hot. <laughs> Can you imagine for a bourgeois? And of course, that was the intent. What is the value, but the constructedness behind? So not on the surface, but also in the system within which those forms are received, perceived, and evaluated. So when Oscar Wilde, uh, in a boutade, he would say that beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder, well, he was at least pointing out the ideological constructedness of our perception of what is beauty, or what is ugliness, etc. And that's exactly what Marcel Duchamp and the generations of future new Dadaists, Marcel Duchamp, he is at the head of one of the most controversial, fascinating movements ever. A unique movement in that they created themselves and they established the very moment they were created, the date of their suicide as a movement. And they have this kind of procession. They went to Le Pont des Arts in Paris and they just dropped some kind of prompt in the river. And that was the end of their art and their movement. And Dada, apparently, so goes the narrative, they were having a wonderful, happy hour, and they were just turning the pages of this children's dictionary, and they come up with this Dada, which sounds almost like an onomatopoeia. So can you imagine Impressionism? Well, related to impressions. Expressionism, expression of the feelings. Cubism, because it was the reconstruction of forms. Dada. <laughs> OK, so it's absolutely new. And the value was the very point of their argument. So the idea that art can be beautiful, can be ugly, but those are questions of commonly shared constructions that are ideologically charged. There is no universal beauty. There is no such a thing as Neoplatonic purity. It is all embedded in social behavior, social attitudes, social values. And in fact, one of the followers of Marcel Duchamp, the Italian artist of the so-called Neo Dada, Piero Manzoni, in 1961, he probably had one of the worst diarrheas in the whole history of art because he had what he called merda d'artista, literally. I think you all understand what is that without translation, but it is. And I've never had any restoration, so I don't know whether they have ever opened, but I do know that it was, wait, conservata al naturale, so it's very preserved in the natural, and it is. Uh, a scanned product made on May 1961. And that becomes a series. And of course, because it was so revolting, it was so disgusting, nothing is created just like LHOQ. So the form is no longer the result of a process of elaboration, but art in this transition between modern and postmodern is no longer the new, the individually created contribution, but it's a critique. Art no longer answers or illustrates ideology, but makes them clear, expose their potential fallacies, the fact that they're all indeed constructions. And this has become a major point. Even nowadays, our perception of artists, they do change. Raphael, he used to be literally venerated like a saint, 
regard, the 17th and the 18th century, prior to Impressionism or Realism in Paris, Raphael was the ultimate expression of perfection for fine art and the, 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 the first academies in Paris, London, etc. Nowadays, I dare say that in Wheel of Fortune, if you think of Raphael, aside from Michelangelo and Leonardo, there is no comparing. But Raphael, in fact, so this new form of art critique would point out, might have worked as the container of certain appreciations of beauty for specific audiences. Our audiences, too, they might have different kinds, some that we would feel disturbed by or we'd agree upon, but that's the very point. Art no longer creates because it's part of a system that we, that we define culture that can be asphyxiating. We are very often sharing commonplaces, values, without feeling like, without ever understanding or fully thinking about why should I pay attention? And this is a question that honestly, I keep raising every morning with my students. Why on earth every morning in Salem, Oregon, should we be talking about Michelangelo? What is truly there for us to discuss, to build ourselves, our perception of the world, our on a constructive basis. So, in other words, culture can become not productive, but counterproductive. And Jean de Buffet, in the 40s, and immediately uh, right after World War II, he's going to write some of the most dense and problematic tasks that are going to reassess the very definition of art, thus borrowing from Marcel Duchamp and this idea that art is primarily something there, ready-made, and it's not something that it's created, but it's perceived as art. And therefore, the question is not the validity or the value of the artist, but what is it that we are sharing, sometimes tacitly, to consider certain forms as artistic creations. And here, he is going to explore a theme that it's very important, the notion of beauty, ugliness, the very notion that culture can paralyze. There is an in industry, the, the films uh, or the entertainment. Sometimes we are just assuming certain preferences. Think of the fashion. How very often we are wearing uh, jeans or other clothes and we are thinking that we are cool, that we are elegant, that we, more importantly, we are unique. Well, we are from a different generation, so we have that critical detachment of thinking about the ideological constructs behind it. But younger people, they are just, oh, I am very cool and I'm very unique in that aisle. My jeans is, you know, has a, really? But there is another thousand of people as individually as yourself, or the selves, etc. So this is a point that art has come into being a question mark for us to understand that it can be paralyzing instead of stimulating when ideas are no longer elements of discussion, exchange, and they're no longer moving, but they have become isolated, fixed forms of belief, there is something wrong. So what he's going to be doing is fascinating too. First of all, technically, he's going to at first use a method, a working procedure, quite similar to Jackson Pollock's. He's going to drip tones of ink and pigments on the canvas. Then once it's about to get dried, with the reverse side of the brush strokes, not the, the hair side, but the wooden part, he's going to cut, almost as though he wants to make the material suffer. So it's almost traumatic, which is more of a sculptor rendering and not a pictorial because he's not adding, he's subtracting in the forms that are going to result, well, we can talk about childish looking forms, forms that are not orthodoxically beauty, beautiful, etc. But what they represent is this very idea of scheme of beauty. So it's not something that we can just assume that we're all going to agree upon that it's beautiful. Again, it presents itself as a sort of a challenge, a visual question. Do you like me? Elaborate. You are no longer going to assume that, well, of course we do, right? Raphael, Leonardo, we all, we, we don't have to, to talk about Mona Lisa. We all no longer. So there is a disruptor. There is a rupture. And in fact, he's going to be the founder 
also from a theoretical standpoint, of what he called art brut, which literally means raw art. Raw art. Art had become a profession, had become a discipline. And artists, they are now, by 1950s, they were expected to be trained. So there are a series of techniques, there's a series of procedures that they were expected to be familiar with. So they will become painters, engravers, etc. So the technique with the capital T has become almost the stigmata of the artist. Well, but what about non-trained artists? What if they can, because of their instinct, because of their gut, so to speak, if they can create something that is aesthetically provocative, it's aesthetically enticing, and they're not trained? So there is a form of art that it's not professional, it's unprofessional, but can have other narratives. It doesn't belong to the mainstream narrative of the history of art, at least not back then. And this is going to be called, in fact, especially in Anglo-Saxon countries, outsider art. Because there's one art that has been already elaborated as a value tied to history, the history of art, but there are some other elements, some other kind of creations that they do not belong or haven't become part of a chain. Therefore, what if children, for instance, or mentally challenged people, what if they have other sources and resources to create maybe even a more authentic kind of art? And what if we have already over-constructed upon the value of art that unless you didn't graduate from Harvard in the fine arts department, you are not an artist? And this kind of uh, reasoning happens very often in the circuit, and especially in the market of contemporary art. It's very mafia-oriented sometimes that if you do not belong, socially speaking, to certain entourages, to certain circles of acquaintances, you are not just going to get there. So that's more of a social problem than aesthetic value. And that's exactly the kind of reassessment that Marcel Duchamp and his followers, Piero Manzoni, and in particular Jean de Buffet, they are going to point out. In fact, he is, as an art collector, the creator, the organizer of one of the most interesting museums that there is to be visited. And I would strongly recommend you, if you ever go to Switzerland, to Lausanne, there is the Le Musée de l'Art Brut, or the Museum of Raw Art, which is breathtaking. Most of the cases, they, next to the museum, there was a hospital, a psychiatric clinic. So many of the patients, they were treated uh, through and thanks to art therapy. But then the results, some of them, they are absolutely phenomenal in that out of instinct, out of curiosity, out of experimentation, they reached forms of abstraction, forms of representational artworks that are just phenomenal indeed, in that they create a phenomenon that poses the question, they were not trained, where does it come from then? In what category should you, I use in order to critically elaborate upon them? Can I use categories such as perfection, cleanness, accuracy, diligence, or are those already misleading notions? So in other words, what we have, for instance, in this work that I saw in November at the Biennale at Venice, it was there and I had tears in my eyes because I had seen this work nearly 10 years ago when I went to Musée de la Brue and I saw it. And this is the work by Judith Scott, an American artist who had the, uh, the Down syndrome. And she would literally encapsulate forms, objects, from scissors to, to everything that belonged to, their day, to her daily routine within those almost spider-like nets. And the forms that she would create for over 50 years of production, they, they are just mesmerizing. You could talk about minimalism. You could talk about Eva Hesse. You could talk about conceptual art. You could talk about Roger uh, Francis Bacon. And there are just so many parallels. That's the point, parallels. But do we need to use those anchors, those maps that had been described according to art historical discourses to understand?
Or are there other means for us to reach, to feel, to think about the value of those arts, those artifacts that are not really artistic, and that they do not belong to a trained professional, but they are aesthetic. And this is one of the major uh, reassessments of postmodern theory. One thing is the art object that in order to be convalidated be, must be part of a system, the system of the arts. And then you may use all the narratives, all the categories, <coughs> Renaissance, etc., as we did in the first half of this talk. But then what about aesthetic values? Have, has it ever happened to you? You were walking, oh my god, look at this stain. It is just like uh, René Magritte. It's just like uh, Henri Matisse, but it's not. So but doesn't it have any artistic value? It doesn't. But it does have aesthetic possibilities. So we have this divide, which I think is very stimulating indeed. Raphael, for instance, it is art tied. When he made, as a sort of a wedding portrait with his signature, uh, the idealized the depiction of his beloved for Narina, of course he was using a model. So he was incorporated just like Judith Scott, things, objects, values that belonged to his tradition, the Pudica Venus, because of course he is constructing a narrative of purity. She is going to become the mother, hence the breast. She is pointing, not because she is obscene, but she is indeed framing the very symbol of motherhood while pointing that he is going to be the father, and her womb is going to be transformed, the vessel of a new life. But it's all under the jurisdictions of puditizia, or discretion. So she's just like that Venus. But of course, here, we are talking about certain values, chastity, virginity, values that belong or are culturally, historically oriented, and in fact, that's exactly what postmodern artist Cindy Sherman is going to play with. She's going to play ironically, sometimes in very grotesque, pathetic forms, to unveil, to reveal the constructedness, the ideological constraints of those narratives of purity, chastity, beauty, etc. Because in fact, this is what we are talking about, manipulation of individuals. And that's the reason why she's going to have so many performances. And some of them, they are disturbing. Don't get me wrong, because that's what they are supposed to be, to be almost aggressively new, offensive. So we're going to think about it. Why did I react in that way? It is no longer our comfort zone. Remember Aristotle, our good philosopher, well, he made it the very definition of art, the idea of catharsis, meaning that you are going to be aware that whatever experience you are having in front of a theatrical performance, and by extension of a painting, a sculptor, it is a secondhand experience because it is represented. So there is a safe zone, there is an intermediary, there is a separation, and therefore, because you feel safe, you are going to look at those forms as a new kind of experience, detach it. Your life is not under risk. But then you can think, films, war films. Oh, we just love them. How can you possibly say that? It's about war. Well, but then, because we know that there are, those are constructed narratives, I can articulate my positions, my reactions, and I can understand. Blah. So it is a different kind of experience, much more I would say, related to the realization that we're looking at constructed narratives. And that's the reason why Cindy Sherman, she poses, she argues that there is not even one fraction of second in our lives in which we're not posing. Even when we are alone in front of the mirror, we are inevitably, sometimes unconsciously, posing. Because we have learned how to behave, how to act, how to use our body, our gestures, etc. So there is no literal possibility of life for her, which is a very drastic statement. And therefore, she poses for you to acknowledge that it looks like a pose. This is a 1981 picture called Movie Still, and it looks like a fragment of a I don't know, Hitchcock, maybe, but it does have certain nuances, certain, so it reverberates something that you know, but you can't, 
because it's a question, it's new. So this idea of rethinking about our own references, our own perceptions, it's the very core of his work. And what is the selfie? But the ultimate expression of posing. I am constructing a self to be posted. So it's not, and, and people misleadingly would believe that they are just so natural, nonchalant. And how come that they're always smiling and making gestures and becoming a robot? Because of course they are posing again without acknowledging that. That's the moment in which culture has become asphyxiating, to use Jean de Buffet's terminology. And in fact, art becomes a question. Cecine Pine Peep, remember, this is not a pipe. It is a representation for you to believe for a second. And then in the second second, you would question that very belief. How come that I thought that this was actually a pipe? Is that because certain forms had been so diffused and had become such a cliche that now I read white as light? And don't get me wrong, it creates an optical illusion. But this is the result of centuries of elaboration that now we have incorporated, absorbed to such a degree that we no longer think about it. And therefore we forget that this incredibly persuasive, convincingly three-dimensional floating pipe is not a pipe, it's a representation. And that's what Michel Foucault, in one of the most brilliant postmodern essays on the constructedness of representations, he's going to argue that now we are exchanging forms for what he calls calligrams, or broken calligrams. Calligrams is those forms of representations in which the semantic and the formal part, they are intertwined. There is to say, the meaning and the forms, they are fused. So elephant looks like an elephant. So that's a perfect example of calligram, very common, especially in uh, an iconic art form, such as uh, among Muslims. So Islamic art, because it is an iconic, it doesn't use figures, very often you're going to have words as though they were visual forms, but they are not. So this is a calligram, and we are no longer thinking that when we are calling this image a pipe, we are just assuming it as a calligram. So what contemporary art has the very task to do is to break the calligrams. Look at those forms. Abstract, you would say. In the work by René Magritte, this is the very first version of Cécine Paz in Pipe. When we just put it here, we are going to somehow establish a connection. And then, I dare say that everybody in this room would, oh, indeed, it is a pipe. No, but we are led to believe. So art has become a question. And conceptual artists, uh, that Jacques Derrida, for instance, is going to be a philosopher, a uh, mentor for, such as Joseph Kossuth, they are going to create installations in which forms and forms of representation are going to be exposed one next to the other. And then for you to realize, to elaborate, to reflect upon, what is the difference between this photographic representation of this three-dimensional representation of this verbal representation of chair? Can you touch the platonic idea of chair? You can't. So with that in mind, you are going to deal with notions of representational art. And sometimes they are going to challenge our very experience. You are not even going to understand in postmodern forms of art, what are they? What are they supposed to represent? What kind of actions and interactions are they demanding, inviting me to perform? This is a sculpture, a statue. Does it look like a statue to you? What would be, according to the cliché, to the historically conditioned definition of statue or, or sculpture, a three-dimensional, full-rounded form that occupies volume in a space, preferably with human forms? Well, you have nothing. In fact, in certain museums, when minimal artist Carl Andre exposed back in 1969 his first uh, very contradictory uh, sculptures, they were set on the floor, 
without any marking divide. So they looked like the floor and people just would walk on and through. And that's exactly what they're supposed to. And nowadays we have the contradiction that people would be furious. I, for instance, had this experience at the modern Tate Gallery in London. Once I saw Carl Andre, and because I knew, I was just went through and just, oh my God, some people got mad at me. What are you doing? You were not so, oh no, that's the very point of this kind of art. I wouldn't, you know, go through a Bernini because that's a different mentality. But that's what this, in fact, the material itself, it's so hard that I dare say that my shoes are not going to break all those iron made tile looking forms because it is almost the subtraction of the commonplaces. And art is the use we make of it, the interaction. That's the reason why in installations, uh, perf performative forms of art, they are so uh, common nowadays in our post-modern, post-historical era, because of course they are questioning the very relationship between spectator and art. We are making art while we are considering them so. In fact, one of the most interesting, our very good friend, Umberto Eco, uh, one of the most interesting theories about this new components, this more performative components of postmodern art, has been written by Umberto Eco back in 1952. Opera Aperta, open work. It's one of the most influential texts. It was translated into English immediately in the same year, and ever since it had become a turning point in the reflections about art. Opera aperta, it's not open in that it stimulates a variety of interpretations, or no, the semantic, uh, what we would call the polysemy of the art, that it may have so many different meanings, implications, that's one thing. But what he's talking about here is the art as an action or acted art. In fact, many sculptors, music scores, installations, videos, and you name it, they're going to demand the participation, the physical interaction of the uh, spectator to become an object. They have no fixed form. They are just an itinerary for us to go through. So this very work by Ligia Clark, for instance, you are going to re-articulate, and of course, every time that you are going to change the resulting form, the combination is going to be different. So the result, what modern artists would, to belie would believe as art, is open for you to recreate. In uh, Seattle, at the uh, Seattle Art Museum a few years ago, there was this very interesting installation by an Italian artist, Iole Alessandrini, who lives in Seattle, been living there for two decades, which was a green laser-made installation. You would enter, just imagine, in a room such as this one here, with those lines creating what I would call walls of light. And you would, because of the space, you would feel compelled just to go through for the very excitement of seeing you in the lights, etc. But then you would realize that depending on the very surface of the laser that you would be touching, parts of music scores and music notations, they were related to a computer-based machinery. So every time that you would cross, sounds would be produced. So it is a multi-sensorial experience. And of course, at first you may randomly run, and needless to say, children, dancers, they were just in their element. But once you realize that you could perform better, you could improve your performance, if you knew, and remember that in certain areas there is a do, a re, there are me, a fa, you would play music through the almost theatricality of your performance. So the work does not exist without and prior to the intervention. And there are many more examples of that. And this is one, I would say, the most promising tendencies of postmodern art. The one that demands for us to experience art, not because it is related to a site, because it is immediately assigned to an artist that you can frame, you can label, you can name, but because it stimulates a new perception of the whole space. And this is a work by Damien Hirst, one of the earliest installations in a gallery in New York, 
in which you would enter the space without any immediately recognizable artwork, because those fabrics were the installation, but they were occupying the very space of the city. So the boundaries of art, they're no longer historically, chronologically, nominally set, but they depend upon your very exploring new roads. In other words, now that we are dealing with the aesthetic possibilities, aside from the artistically trained artists or the artworks, it is extended infinitely indeed. So much more intriguing, but also it raises the question of the responsibility of the spectator slash creator. We are collaborating. Well, thank you. And if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer. And as you can easily imagine, it was just so hard for me to select certain <laughs> points of this astronomic problem. So I'm going to use this one, right? Yes. Uh, Professor uh, Bob Muir, we identify ourselves for the rest of the group. OK, thank you. Mike, there are lots of questions. But uh, at the extreme of uh, art today, is there not solipsism and a condition of, well, I would say meaninglessness is not quite accurate, but mm -hmm. indeterminacy, uh, radical indeterminacy about meaning? In fact, um, the very question of indetermination or indeterminacy has been pointed out by Umberto Eco is the very title of one of the chapters of Opera Aperta. Because of course it opens up a territory whose limits, whose directions are not immediately conceived or they're not set before you're thinking about that. There is, and that's part of the problem, but also of the, new, the newly assessed value which raises, as I said, an ethical issue. And there are many manipulations in this world. There are absolutely tautological artworks that they pretend to be artistic or even aesthetic, while they are not. But on the other hand, I have to say that I'm very optimistic. If you go to the Biennale, if you go, I've been to the Documenta in Castle last year, and there are just so many ways of creating forms that indeed we hadn't seen before. So I am more convinced than ever that this indeterminacy is paradoxically the core of new possible horizons that haven't been described yet, whose narrative is yet to be contemplated. But they are there for us to experience. In perplexity, shock, surprise. They've been very often presented as new categories. Walter Benjamin, for instance, he is going to use the very um, notion of stoss or shock as the uh, distinctive feeling that uh, a spectator should have while he or she will be in front, will be facing, will be looking at a new form of art. Because if you know already what you're looking at, your experience is going to be prepared and even in some kind uh, oriented. But if you truly have the experience of something new, you ought to feel discomfort, uneasiness, and, and sometimes shock, even rage. How very often it happened to me that I was outraged when I saw something, even films. Oh my god, I couldn't stand that guy. Blah, blah, blah. And the more I thought, and I just sped, and I just struggled, and I would strangle the guy. And I, oh my god, what a brilliant work it was. <laughs> There was, it was so aggressively new that I didn't have the instruments to articulate immediately. So I had to go through a process. That's what I, I claim with Jean de Buffet. It's important to acknowledge that art is not a vocabulary for us to learn, but experiences for us to be bold enough to undertake. And sometimes we are not just prepared, but the humility of self-realization is part of the process. It is a pedagogical process after all. Art has its function. It orients, it helps us to build our very notion of reality, of our relationship with the universe, with the friends, with everything really. Not for that, I'm an art historian. <laughs> Hi, this is Sally. Sally. Um, do you have a favorite period of art personally? 
Oh, well, I do, I do, of course, I do my beloved Flemish artists from the Renaissance, but it's just, you know, my no longer secret place, but I do, I do. Th those are for reasons that I don't fully realize why. Every time that I see artists such as Hendrik Horzus, Albrecht Dürer, oh, I'm speechless. But that doesn't mean that I can't have this equivalent experience while looking at Henri Matisse, Paul Klee, uh, or to, to quote postmodern artists, Anselm Kiefer, oh, there, there is. I think that's the Stoss, that, uh, that's the preliminary phases of the Stoss. When you were with that syndrome of paralysis, it's just overwhelming. So I do have the uh, Northern Renaissance, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I will deny. <laughs> yes, please. Hi, um, this is Bill. Um, question, I struggle some with some of all the labels that get put on to movements and like, you know, the, your use of neoplasticism, mm -hmm. with what I recognize as being de style. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I'm a little bit um, toying with the concept of postmodernism mm -hmm. and where it goes and what comes after? Well, that's a very good question. And where it goes next? Well, there is something that uh, being no prophet, I can tell. I can tell what's going on right now in the directions, certain directions that we are taking. And some of the directions, they are not even forward quite the opposite. They are backwards in that we are reinstating, for instance, there's a, there's a very interesting phenomenon, especially in Central Europe, in Germany, in, in certain areas of Poland, uh, which we would call nowadays the painting, the pictorial painting or the painting painting, in that they are massively returning to this very idea of materiality, of representation, of well-trained hands, etc., with all ideological baggage that comes along. So it is very true. And the very category of postmodern or postmodernism, it can be read on so many different levels. Uh, James Fredrickson, for instance, one of the earliest writers, uh, and not necessarily an art historian, but I would say a philosopher of the history of mentality, used this category to define new perceptions of the world economy for instance, and how art is related to market-oriented phenomena, and even phenomena of manipulation of values, uh, contract, you know, negotiations, and such. So art has become part of a much larger phenomenon, and that's one of the distinctive features between modern and postmodern art. While po modern artists or theoreticians, they believed that art somehow could either help or, and I still believe, I, I would claim myself as being a modernist, indeed, in that sense, and to go even backward, a humanist, for that matter, because those are concepts that I can handle, I can learn, and I can still use, and I think they are highly productive. Whereas in the area uh, that you pointed out, a little gray of certain postmodern experiences, they're a little just too uncertain for me to grasp. And as I said, I take it that it's part of the phenomenon. Being modernus, according to the first century, or being contemporary, it's possibly the hardest task because you have to understand what's not fully achieved. So you have to anticipate phenomena, consequences, etc., which is very, very difficult indeed, philosophically challenging, and socially too, of course. So I think that very many categories belonging to, I wouldn't call it old fashioned, but very functional um, methodological, conceptual um, baggage of the modern art is still productive. Uh, my name is uh, David, right over here. Oh, yes, yeah. David. Uh, it seems like uh, Western art goes through phases. Uh, over the years, uh, and we got, we got into this uh, modernist or postmodernist phase. Mm -hmm. Do you know if Oriental art does the same sort of thing, uh, Japanese or Chinese art? It, it, it actually does. It actually does. And depending on the narratives, of course, and the, the extension of your um, 
uh, areas and times of analysis, you're going to perceive a much more multi-layered and complex uh, dynamics. Indeed, this, this notion that in Eastern art, it's um, uh, less contradictory, there are lesser phenomena, that is misleading because there are. If you look at 15th or 16th century Indian art, you would be surprised. It's just like having four, five universes simultaneously at work. The presence of Jesuits in Japan, in China, have altered so dramatically certain dynamics too, and they are just one of many other factors too. So when you were getting more micro-historical, you would see many more tendencies in a variety of phenomena as well. Not to mention now the postmodern or ultra-modern, there's a, a newly um, invented term too, uh, for Chinese art in particular. I dare say that of all contemporary art markets, the Chinese is one of the most promising, and it goes along with Frederick Jameson's idea of economy too. The leading economies, they are also carrying new forms of art and promoting them. So there, there, there are those uh, differences and those nuances also in, the, uh, in many what we would call oriental art. There are, there are. Yes? Sometimes it's just regional. If you take, for instance, in Japan, the technique of ukiyo-e, uh, the woodcut, well, you're going to see many differences on the level of style, working procedures, depending whether they are from Okahama or if they are from Tokyo or from Nagasaki. So there are, there are. Um, it, it seems from what you have said that with the newest versions of art, um, that involve the participant as someone who essentially creates the art by their act, actions of interacting with whatever is spread before them, that were that the rules of sort of a pertaining to what is art have changed mm -hmm. substantially. So doesn't that essentially mean that if you don't have any defined rules or limits or ideas of what art is supposed to be, then anything mm -hmm. could be art. That's yeah. what I call the ethical problem of that, indeed. I, I, I would say that instead of feeling sadness, I feel over, overjoyed, overwhelmed, because indeed it has allowed me to structure as aesthetic experiences some forms of action, some perceptions that in the past wouldn't have. So I think it has granted us a new possibility, and along with that, the responsibility of constantly thinking about it. So many cases of postmodern art is not for the playfulness of it, the sake of going through or you know, walking around, no, but for you to perceive that as a particular form of experience that lasts in a special moment of your life, and therefore it invites you to consider, to think about, so it is self-reflexive in that sense. And I, I wouldn't use sadness in any, any ways to define it. I think it's overwhelming because if you're going through that experience, you're going to have some even possibilities that you hadn't realized were possible at first. So I, I felt that I, we, we earned a lot, which doesn't mean that all that it's out there is equally valid. But again, our perception, our responsibility, our idea of what is exciting, but, but we are going to construct that individually, but also sharing experiences. So I think it's rather exciting, personally. It can be confusing, but if you think about that, Picasso was confusing. And nowadays, oh my God, that's the easiest form of art of all, right? How come that people, when I ask my students, uh, I don't know whether you have all in your minds, uh, Edouard Manet's uh, Olympia, or um, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, il, uh, il lunch on the grass. 1863, people would literally throw out, vomit in front of that, get in, in, scream at the scandal. Nowadays, oh my God. Right? So this idea of reassessing values through experience, I think it's one of the most valid experiences through art, indeed. It, it teaches it, us new, new directions, in fact. It may seem confusing now, disturbing, sometimes even annoying, 
but then you may, you may come to realize something that you have never thought of before. It's challenging, it is. Yes, yes, please. Hi, this is Ingrid. Uh, aren't people very often opposed to something new, not only in art, in other areas as well? And mm -hmm. uh, doesn't it take uh, quite a little time <laughs> more for others and some uh, to get used to that? Mm -hmm. That's very true, that's very true. If you think about the reaction, uh, just to go beyond the visual arts, James Joyce's Ulysses, right? Because of the famous defecating chapter. Really, in 16th century Netherlandish art, just to, to come back with my beloved artists, there was an artist, he was notoriously famous as the defecating man, because he would insert a defecating person as a sort of a curious, uh, sort of an identifiable sign of his presence in all his compositions. So to provoke, to screen one's independence has been very often part of the creative process. Sometimes it may relate it to uh, particularly competitive markets, for instance, in the Netherlands, uh, because there are no longer this idea of commission and churches were no longer uh, creating the conditions for art. Well, many engravers, painters, they have to create other forms to, to capture the audience's attention. And very often, pornography, obscene forms, or even uh, vulgar expressions would be incorporated and afterward transformed or rendered acceptable. Just like nowadays, if you look at Piero Manzoni, the, the artist shit, you wouldn't think twice about that, right? Because it makes sense in that year, historically, etc. Or it's still provocatory or provocative. It, it may, it may. Some phenomena last longer. That's the long durée. It depends, really. Thank you, Professor. Well, thank you all. You, you have um, loaded our minds with many, many things. <laughs> provocative, provocative. That's arts task. <laughs> thank anyway, you. thank you for coming and sharing this.